uh, I'm always reminded, speaking of the Civil War, of Abraham Lincoln uh, characterizing a, a speaker who went on for several hours. He said that that man can say, use more words to say uh, so little than any other human being that I know. So I hope by the time we leave here that I don't use that many words and I hope that I've said something that's useful to you. Um, the engraving that you see there of Nashville is from a Harper's Weekly, March 1862, and I thought showing this pastoral view of this relatively small town uh, gives you some idea of what America was like before the Civil War. As we all know, and um, as I was reminded in Chattanooga, the United States had about 34 million people in 1860. By the time this terrible war was over, there were, uh, there are various estimates, a minimum of 600,000 soldiers who died in that war, maybe 700,000, uh, untold numbers of civilians, uh, incredible devastation throughout the South. It's really hard to fathom what, a, what that conflict was all about and, and, and what a profound impact it had on America. If you were to calculate the soldier deaths in terms of our population today, I think we would have 20 million dead. And that gives you some idea of, of what that, of the magnitude of that conflict. Um, so we're gonna be talking about Tennessee Unionists. Well, what is a Unionist? Of course, that's somebody who adhered to the concept of the Union of the federal government and opposed secession. So, what was the compelling reason that they would have been a unionist? Well, not surprisingly, it went from A to Z. Uh, were, they, uh, were they embracing the Constitution, the concept of union, the founding fathers, the way they interpreted the founding fathers? Uh, were they abolitionists? Uh, and of course, it runs the full gamut uh, when we look at Tennesseans and unionists. Uh, and uh, was it localism? Did they join this army or that army because they're, all of the people in their hometown were doing the same thing? A man named Gary Gallagher has written a book called The Union War, and he maintains that we, particularly in these times, uh, attribute too much uh, 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 to the, the uh, motives of the Union and the war and Lincoln, and he maintains that looking over all the sol soldiers, letters and diaries and that sort of thing, that was really the concept of union that even propelled the North in the Civil War, which is a concept we have a hard time embracing. It wasn't anti-slavery, it wasn't abolitionism. But then he gets accused of being anecdotal himself. So uh, it, it's almost a person by person story. So we're gonna be looking at a few of individual stories. Um, as you know, uh, as the Union began to disintegrate and South Carolina seceded in December 1860, uh, there were those in Tennessee who wanted Tennessee to join the Confederacy and it was put to a popular vote. Now, of course, the only people who could vote generally were uh, white males at that time. So it was put to a vote in February and Tennesseans decided to stay in the Union by a vote of uh, 69,000 to 58,000. But then with the firing on Fort Sumter in April 1861 and Lincoln's call for 75,000 troops to put down the rebellion, Tennesseans changed their mind. And the change really came here in Middle Tennessee. Uh, East Tennessee remained unionist. Uh, their votes in the referendum, the next referendum was held in June, was pro-union. West Tennessee had been pro-secession in February. Middle Tennessee flipped. Middle Tennessee went from union to secession. Uh, and it may have been like Isham Harris when he in his response to Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln called for a certain number of troops from Tennessee to put down the rebellion. Harris, who was very pro-secession, wrote back, Tennessee will not furnish a single man for purposes of coercion, but 50,000 if necessary for the defense of our rights and those of our Southern brothers. Well, in fact, 
As we know, Tennessee ended up furnishing, out of a population of a million, which includes slaves, Tennessee furnished well over 100,000 for the Confederacy and 50,000 for the Union. That again is a symbol of how profound this conflict was. So in June, we had another referendum, but this time the vote was 47,000 to 105,000, 105,000 voting for secession. Well, Tennessee was already moving towards secession even before that referendum. Well, one man who adhered to the Union, and I think we, we need to talk about a couple of them, who <coughs> adhered to the Union and then switched. A leader as a Unionist is John Bell, John Bell of Middle Tennessee, an attorney here. Uh, this is an envelope showing his uh, loyalty to the Union. Uh, he was a Whig. He had been Secretary of War under William Henry Harrison, briefly. Uh, he was elected to the United States Senate in 1847. Of course, in those days, the voters didn't elect senators. The state legislature elected senators. But he had opposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which the pro-slavery uh, delegation in Congress had supported. He had voted against Kansas coming into the Union as a slave state. So in 1859, the legislature turned him out of office as the United States Senator. But he became the champion of Union and reconciliation running on the Constitutional Union ticket. We had the Democratic Party split into three factions. We had Abraham Lincoln as a Republican and then John Bell representing Union and Reconciliation. He carried the border states, but that was pretty much it. And this is kind of a celebration of him as a Unionist. Uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, document for a couple of reasons. Uh, Edward Everett, who is running as his vice presidential candidate, was the long-winded orator in November 1863 at Gettysburg. There was another man there, Abraham Lincoln, who gave a very brief speech, which everyone remembers. No one remembers Edward Everett. And he knew that as soon as the, as, as the ceremony was over. Uh, but there is an elector there, Bailey Payton. We're gonna talk about Bailey Payton, who's a Tennessee Unionist uh, a little while later too. Well, when push came to shove, when Tennessee seceded, you had to make a choice. You go with the Union, or do you go with your family, your friends? What do you do? John Bell very reluctantly finally de declared himself to be a Southern man and went with the South. So somebody took one of these envelopes and stamped traitor over it. We have several of these in our collection. Don't, don't know what the story is. Um, and, and I meant to have a picture of him up here instead of this note, but we're gonna go with the note. Another Tennessean somewhat similar was Alexander P. Stewart. This is a note he wrote in 1895. Um, he was uh, born in Hawkins County, East Tennessee, uh, graduated from West Point, uh, did not stay in the military. He was teaching mathematics at uh, Cumberland College in Lebanon when the war broke out. He was very much a unionist, very much against secession. But again, he had to make a decision. So here's a unionist, who when Tennessee secedes, reluctantly casts his lot with the Confederacy. And as you can see from this note, rose to the rank of Lieutenant General, three-star general. Tennessee only had two individuals rise to that rank. One was Nathan Bedford Forrest, and the other was Alexander P. Stewart, in either army to rise to that kind of rank. And this was when he was one of the commissioners establishing the battlefield at Chickamauga which was the first national uh, military park. Of course, perhaps the most famous unionist from Tennessee would be Andrew Johnson. This is a portrait of him when he was governor. This is painted in 1856. Uh, he, he was, of course, from Greenville, had been elected to alderman there, then mayor, then to the state legislature and then uh, to the United States Senate by the legislature. And he was in the Senate in 1860, 1861, when the secession crisis finally came about. He gave stirring speeches in Congress opposing secession. I quote from one on December the 18th, 1860. Two days later, South Carolina seceded from the Union. 
I am opposed to secession. Though I fought against Lincoln, I love my country. I love the Constitution. My blood, my existence, I would give to save this union. As events played out, he was hardly in, uh, certainly in the beginning of the war, arguably at the, uh, arguably even when he became president, hardly an abolitionist and hardly, hardly an advocate of civil rights for African Americans, but he did believe in the Constitution and the solidarity of the Union. He even came back home uh, in the spring of 1861 to try to keep Tennessee in June from voting for secession, uh, but uh, once Tennessee voted for secession, he left the state and wasn't able to come back here th uh, during the remainder of the war, uh, at least to East Tennessee, to his hometown. He did come back to Nashville. Uh, he was appointed by Abraham Lincoln in 1862 as military governor of Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee really was the first state to prod and start moving in the way uh, towards reconstruction and redefining society and Abraham Lincoln was at, was at the forefront of that and in Tennessee his agent was, was Andrew Johnson. Uh, he, ha he is <clears throat> often accused of being dictatorial and ruthless. He arrested clergymen, newspaper editors. Uh, he'd arrest anybody he thought was an enemy to the union calls. Uh, and in, I think in 1864, in the election of 1864, you were not able to vote unless you were a solid union man, and he went even beyond that. You must swear that you sincerely rejoice in the triumph of the armies and of the navies of the United States, and you will oppose all armistice and negotiations of peace. You had to be solid. Uh, he was a Democrat. He was not a Republican. He ran with Abraham Lincoln on the presidential ticket in 1864. This was perfect for Lincoln. You've got a Southerner, you've got a Democrat, so it's the Union ticket. Uh, people often think he's a Republican because he ran with Lincoln, but he was not a Republican, never was a Republican. Uh, they, uh, of course, were elected and uh, with the assassination of Lincoln in April 1865, Andrew Johnson became president at probably one of the most difficult periods of American history for anyone to be a president. Uh, he had uh, declared that, um, that treason must be made odious and the traitors must be punished and impoverished and their great plantations must be seized. This was music to the ears of those who wanted to punish the South. And they thought it was great that Andrew Johnson was now going to be president of the United States. This would be a man who would help them uh, uh, disenfranchise former Confederates or even those suspected of Confederate inclinations uh, who would be able to seize the property, 40, uh, 40 acres and a mule and all that sort of thing went on. Well, it turned out that uh, Andrew Johnson was an advocate of the common man. The common man was the common white man, the, the laboring man, the, and uh, he pushed through the home, he was pushing the Homestead Act to open the Western territories for, so that uh, farmers could move out there and claim land and, and have a farm, but he was not an advocate of civil rights for African Americans. So he, he, got, uh, he got crosswise with the radicals. And for that and many other reasons, uh, impeachment proceedings were brought against him. This, by the way, this impeachment ticket uh, was in Andrew Johnson's wallet, which we have in our collection. We have several tickets which uh, apparently were held by the Johnson family as souvenirs. And as you know, he was saved by, from being removed in office by one vote. Arguably that vote was David Patterson, who was his son-in-law and a senator from Tennessee who had taken his seat in the Senate. This is his grave in Greenville from an old postcard. Uh, you remember he had this declaration of his adherence to the Constitution. Well, that certainly was what propelled Andrew Johnson that and, and saving democracy and making uh, this land of opportunity for the common white laboring people. 
So he was buried here when he died in 1875, and I should say that he was vindicated when the state legislature re-elected him to the United States Senate in January 1875. He died in July 1875. But uh, so he was buried here in Greenville, wrapped in the American flag with his head resting on the Constitution. <laughs> if you hadn't been to Greenville, this is the place you need to visit. Well, by comparison, we had another United States Senator, um, Alfred O.P. Nicholson, longtime Democratic operative in Tennessee. So the crisis comes along, and A.O.P. Nicholson just kind of goes back home. He's not making any sterling declarations for the South. He's not making any for the Union. He just kind of goes home and doesn't go back to the Senate. They actually have to send a delegation to his house finally to see if he's okay, if there's anything wrong with him. Uh, so this is a man who tried to be neutral. Well, you couldn't be, it was very difficult to be neutral in those days. Uh, he did survive the war and uh, uh, he was a member of the Constitutional Convention of 1870 and uh, then was Chief Justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court until his death in 1876 and was instrumental in some decisions uh, giving the vote back to former Confederates, but still a Unionist. Uh, again, one of the most famous, perhaps second only to Andrew Johnson of Unionists, and arguably even more uh, significant than Andrew Johnson, is Preston Brownlow, William G. Brownlow, a Methodist preacher from East Tennessee. Uh, uh, he was a Whig. Weeks were basically just in opposition to Andrew Jackson and then the Democratic Party. He had a newspaper there, the Knoxville Whig. Uh, this is a, a little penny press booklet that was put out during the war when he became quite famous throughout the North. Uh, interestingly, before the war, he was not only not an abolitionist, he was an outright pro-slavery advocate. He even published a book in 1858, Defending Slavery, and traveled and gave a lecture series, Defending Slavery. Uh, but he was a man, as one biographer said, who seemed to measure his triumphs by how many enemies that he made. Uh, he particularly disliked Democrats. Let's see, I think it, uh, he said that we need to be careful of the foreign influence of the Democratic Party. You know, they had all those Irish in it. And uh, he particularly disliked Catholics. He particularly disliked Presbyterians. I don't think he really cared for much of anybody who wasn't a Methodist and a Brownlow Methodist, and precisely. Um, but uh, uh, one of the Democrats he particularly disliked was Andrew Johnson, whom he called a vile miscreant and a contemptible political prostitute. Those were some of the milder things he might say about people. <laughs> this is uh, Brownlow's, uh, one sheet from Brownlow's newspaper in Knoxville. You'll notice he's added one line to it. I hope you can see it. Uh, Brownlow's Knoxville wig and rebel ventilator. Uh, he was so opposed to the Confederacy that he changed the, the masthead on his newspaper so that he could lambast the Confederates. And he became a political ally of Andrew Johnson's uh, during the Civil War, the, the vile miscreant before the war now is his ally. Um, this is a note we have in our collection. I think it sums up Brownlow. I am an unconditional union man for my God and country at all hazards and to the last extremity. W.G. Brownlow, May 1862. Uh, when the Confederates, uh, ironically, the Confederates held East Tennessee until October 1863. I say ironically because that's where most of the union sentiment in the state was. Also ironically, the Confederates lost most of Middle and West Tennessee, which is where their strength was but they really occupied East Tennessee. They tried to placate Brownlow and the other unionists there, didn't work. Uh, he, he continued to be obstreperous and, the, his, and try to publish his rebel ventilator. 
uh, he was finally arrested and the Confederate authorities expelled him into the Union lines. Uh, he, he then became a great hero throughout the North, the, the, the preacher martyr to the Union. Uh, as you can see from this envelope that was widely circulated. And uh, you probably can't read what is on there, but uh, Gideon Pillow, who, who commanded the Confederate forces, in, or the provisional forces, and then uh, Tennessee's efforts to begin building fortifications, collect arms, and all that thing. Gideon Pillow, who is from Columbia, had invited William G. Brownlow to be a chaplain in the Confederate Army, and this has Brownlow's response to him. When I shall have made up my mind to go to hell, I will cut my own throat and go direct and not travel around by way of the Southern Confederacy. I am very respectfully, W.G. Brownlow. <laughs> Uh, it ran in the family. This is his son, uh, John Brownlow, who was a lieutenant colonel in the Union Army. He had two sons in the Union Army, as did a, a Andrew Johnson, by the way. This is a carte de visite uh, of Brownlow, probably when he was in the, in the United States Senate. Uh, he became the Reconstruction Governor of Tennessee, uh, taking Andrew Johnson's place, who was military governor, when Johnson had to go to Washington uh, to to become vice president, subsequently president. And Brownlow then was elected in a convention here that was kind of a rump convention. Things were done somewhat differently, but not, not altogether differently in politics then the way that, just like they are now. But he became the reconstruction governor of Tennessee, engineered Tennessee, adopting the 14th Amendment. So Tennessee was never part of the Reconstruction Acts. Tennessee was not part of the federal reconstruction largely because of William G. Brownlow. Uh, and then he was sent off to Washington to the, the United States Senate, taking the seat of David Patterson, the son-in-law of Andrew Johnson. Um, but uh, an interesting story. And Brownlow, in pushing the 14th Amendment and the 13th Amendment, had changed his mind completely in terms of African Americans. He said, quote, a loyal Negro is more eminently entitled to suffrage than a disloyal white man. Well, here's another unionist with a very interesting story. This is Thomas A.R. Nelson, uh, an East Tennessean, a Knoxvillian. Uh, this is a portrait by Samuel Shaver. Uh, he, was a, he was a Whig politician, elected to Congress in 1859 and again in 1861. And like Andrew Johnson, gave stirring speeches in support of the Union denouncing secession. When he was elected in 1861, he tried to leave Knoxville and get back to Washington, but he was arrested in Kentucky and sent to jail in Richmond, and they finally allowed him to come back to East Tennessee on the condition that he be quiet and not cause any disturbance, and he generally did that. He was, an, he was a lawyer, so he went about went uh, along and did lawyerly things and didn't really cause any trouble. That is until Abraham Lincoln in September 1862 announced his intention to uh, uh, produce the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation went through several drafts, as you know, but as it came out on January the 1st, 1863, it basically freed the slaves in those parts of the Union still in rebellion. It excluded Tennessee, but it, but it also had just as much effect in Tennessee, honestly, as it did, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But T.A.R. Nelson was appalled by this. And Abraham Lincoln was very reluctant to issue the Emancipation Proclamation because he thought they would alienate Southern Unionists. And this is a perfect example of one who was alienated. He issued this broadside. The Confederate authorities printed it for him, distributed it for him. They were more than happy to do this. Um, this was issued in October 1862, shortly after Lincoln announced his intention for the Emancipation Proclamation. 
My opinion on the unconstitutionality and the impolicy of secession remains unchanged. But Lincoln's proclamation is an act of despotism unequaled in history in terms of atrocity and barbarism. It is spurred by an abolition Congress reeking with the blood of the South and jubilant in the possession of usurped power. Lincoln, he concluded, has become a military dictator. He was not alone in this sentiment. This man, however, an East Tennessean from Jonesboro, was also a newspaper editor, and he was an abolitionist. His name is uh, George Edgar Grisham, and you see him here in the uniform of a captain. Uh, he had no qualifications in his adherence to the Union and his advocacy of abolitionism. Uh, there's a certain symmetry here because the first abolitionist newspaper ever in the United States was the Emancipator in Jonesboro in 1819, 1820, published by Lyo Embry, who was a Quaker. So he's certainly following in that tradition. Uh, we have an incredible photo album of his. Uh, he commanded a company in the 8th Tennessee Cavalry, which were most, almost all East Tennessee boys. And he put this whole al album together for his wife, Maggie. Uh, this is a photograph of him with another Tennessean from the 9th Cavalry. And uh, uh, presumably he sent this to Maggie, and here's Maggie. Um, he uh, even has a poem in there to my to my beloved wife behind rebel lines. Remember, this was still being occupied by the Confederacy when he wrote this. I love this little poem that he wrote to her. Very Victorian. The battle cry now is the theme of my life. There dwells in my heart a sweet feeling of gladness that God will, will restore thee to me. And in fact, he did survive the war. This is a photograph taken of his company on June the 29th, 1864 in Gallatin. So here they were, East Tennessee boys who were basically occupying pro-Confederate Middle Tennessee while East Tennessee is being occupied by the Confederates. Actually, the Union had taken East Tennessee by 1864, but uh, another, another photograph of him. He became, uh, after the war, a leader in Brownlow's Home Guard. The Home Guard was put together to try to uh, suppress the Ku Klux Klan and the pro-Confederates or the ex-Confederates and their activities to regain control of Tennessee. And he was a captain in the Home Guard. Uh, I'm from Sullivan County, so I love his characterization of Sullivan County, which is right next to Washington County. A vile nest of rebels, he called it. <laughs> Sullivan County voted for secession. It's one of the East Tennessee counties that voted for secession. Well, I'll show you this piece of pottery because here's another interesting Union story. This was made by a man named Christopher Hahn in Greene County, Tennessee. There was a whole group of potters there in Greene County. And uh, when the war broke out, <clears throat> they were almost universally pro-Union. In the fall of 1861, the Union came up with a plan to burn the bridges in East Tennessee so that supplies could not move up and down the railroad uh, between uh, the South and up to the Confederate forces in Virginia. So they were going to burn these bridges. They actually provided funding and uh, support and the promise was made that then the Union Army was going to enter East Tennessee once these bridges were burned and, and the Confederates were disrupted. Uh, the railroads were extraordinarily important in those days. We just heard a lecture in Chattanooga that the Union Army, when it was in Chattanooga, had to have 60 boxcars a day of supplies come over the railroad. You couldn't support an army of you know, 50,000 or more without constant supplies, and the railroads were important. So, Christopher Holm was one of the bridge burners, and he was one who was successful. Unfortunately, the Union Army didn't come to their rescue, 
and they were very, uh, several of them were very quickly arrested, taken to Knoxville, tried. He was sentenced to be hanged, and this is an engraving, a fanciful engraving, I'll grant you. We don't have an image of Christopher Holm, uh, of him going to his execution. This is from our friend William Brownlow's book, uh, Sketches of the Rise, Progress, and Decline of Secession. So he's obviously going to portray Hahn as, as a martyr to the Union. It's one of my favorite individuals here, another East Tennessean, Samuel P. Carter of Carter County. He had uh, <clears throat> gone to Annapolis and he was uh, in the U.S. Navy off Buenos Aires when the, when the war broke out. He wrote a letter that we believe went to Andrew Johnson. We're fairly certain Johnson then took it to Lincoln in 1861, and we believe this to be the letter. Uh, go back and show you the portrait. That's also by Samuel Shaver, who was an artist from uh, Sullivan County who was in Knoxville. Uh, he was uh, commissioned to do portraits of Confederate leaders in 1861, 1862, 1863. Uh, only one of those survives. Well, now he's painting this one of uh, Samuel Carter in 1863, right after the Union occupied East Tennessee and Knoxville, which you see here, he's Provost Marshal of East Tennessee. Uh, and this was, uh, once we got this conserved, we know that it was painted from life, we know that it was in Knoxville, we know it's 1863. You probably can't see the detail on the table leg. He's got a, a, uh, uh, an, uh, an anchor there showing his service in the Navy because the Lincoln administration decided to give him a, take him out of the Navy, give him a commission in the Army, and try to help him rally support for the Union in East Tennessee. Uh, so he was instrumental in the Union war effort. Uh, after the war, he retired, he retired from the, or left the Army, went back in the Navy, retired as an admiral. I believe he's the only man in American history uh, to have served as a general in the Army and an admiral in the Navy. Uh, but the Provost Marshal was so powerful, he could, a Provost Marshal could literally order your execution for no reason, and they did. If you were even suspected, they could swear out a warrant that you'd be pulled out of your house and shot. That's it. No trial, no other proceedings. Uh, this is the letter we believe that he wrote to um, Andrew Johnson. We have an incredible collection of his papers that were also donated to us. And he, he, this is a letter written to him, I thought you'd find this interesting, by William G. Brownlow. And Brownlow is complaining that all these Northerners are trying to take all the credit for the Union victory and East Tennesseans and all the work that they're doing is being neglected because of all this conspiracy on the part of all these Yankees. Brownlow didn't like Yankees either, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, he knew right people. Let's see if I can move this off of there. Uh, this is a handwritten letter to him. Make sure I've got the right one. Yeah, uh, by William Tecumseh Sherman. Notice it's near Atlanta, 1864, just before he took Atlanta. And it's all written by, in Sherman's hand and signed your friend, W.T. Sherman. And, and basically saying, these newspaper editors down there in Chattanooga who are giving you a hard time, don't worry about that. We're going to take care of them. This is, a, this is a very interesting note that, that remember he was Provost Marshal, uh, that went to him from John Hunt Morgan. This is about a month before Morgan was killed in Greenville, Tennessee. And Morgan was in command of the Confederate forces in East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia. And what he is saying here, he says, in close, please find a letter from my wife to her mother. Would you please see that she gets it? Well, his wife, Maddie, is from Murfreesboro, which is now, of course, in Union control. She's obviously with her husband, John Hunt Morgan. In order to get a letter to her own parents, she's got to have the, union, the sympathy of the union, union officials to get it there. 
Uh, after the war, I told you he went back into the Navy. Uh, this is a note from Secretary of Navy Gideon Wells informing him that he's being given uh, the rank of commander and uh, praising him for his service in the Army. Uh, by the time the war was over, he was a two-star general. This is a carte de visite we have of Carter. Um, this is an interesting man, Bailey Payton. Uh, this is a photograph of him taken during the Mexican War. It's a large daguerreotype. Uh, he was um, from Gallatin. And when the war came along, he was a stalwart Union man. Take a look at that saber, because I'm going to say something else about that in just a moment. This is his son, Bailey Payton, Jr. Well, Bailey Payton was a Confederate, a secessionist. Uh, and he joined the 20th Tennessee. He was a lieutenant, the Hickory Guards. And on the 19th of January, uh, 18, 1862, while carrying his father's saber from the Mexican War, he was killed at the Battle of Mill Springs. So here, Bailey Payton and his wife, and who were Unionists ended up mourning the death of their son fighting for the Confederacy. A similar story is uh, the, the father of Old Glory, uh, William Driver. We're all familiar with William Driver, the Massachusetts sea captain who moved to Nashville in 1837. Uh, his wife had died in Massachusetts. He brought his young children down here because he had two brothers here. Uh, ends up remarrying and having a number of other children and brought his flag that he had named Old Glory with him. Lived on Fifth Avenue. They used to hang that flag across the street uh, on election days and, and holidays such as the 4th of July. Uh, well, secession comes along. He remains an outspoken adherent of the Union. Uh, he stopped going to Christ Episcopal Church because they would no longer allow him to pray for the President of the United States. Uh, he would write letters to one daughter who was back in Salem, Massachusetts, and they were printed in newspapers, so those are interesting to read about. He's working as a volunteer in a hospital here as they're bringing wounded down from the battles of uh, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. Uh, Middle Tennessee falls to the Union forces. February 25th, the Union Army appears here in Nashville. William Driver had hidden old glory in a quilt. He pulls it out of the quilt and offers it to the Union forces to fly over the Tennessee State Capitol. He became celebrated throughout the North as this, you know, I say Barbara Fritchie character who's, you know, portrayed as this elderly man, which he wasn't, but this elderly man who had maintained his faith in the Union and pulls his hidden flag out and it flies over the Capitol. So it becomes quite celebrated. His flag becomes celebrated. Old Glory ultimately becomes the name that we all attach to every United States flag. There flies Old Glory because of this man and that story. Well, this is not a Union flag. This is a Confederate flag of the Rock City Guards, a Union right here, a unit right here out of Nashville. And I show it to you because William Driver's son and apparently all members of his family were pro-Confederate. That's why he hid the flag. He had at least two and perhaps three sons in the Confederate Army. Rock City Guards was where George Driver, uh, George Driver was a member of the Rock City Guards probably present when the ladies of Nashville presented this flag to their unit. This is George Driver's Bible. I show it to you because he had it with him when he died of his wounds received at the Battle of Perryville in October 1862. So William Driver, the great champion of the Union, uh, the man who named our flag Old Glory, had a son die fighting for the Confederacy. If you ever go out by City Cemetery, William Driver's buried there. I hope you've been by to, to see his, uh, his grave and his monument, which was designed by him. This is his daughter, Mary, with Old Glory. Behind her, he gave the flag to her in 1875. 
she eventually uh, donated the flag to, it, it, to the President of the United States, gave it to the Smithsonian Institution, but all of her papers went to the Tennessee State Library and Archive. It is a treasure trove of information on Old Glory and the Driver family. Well, one of the most important stories of unionism in Tennessee, of course, is African Americans. And there is so much to tell here. We mentioned the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation provided an opportunity for African Americans to join the Union Army. This was incredible. It, but remember, it didn't apply to Tennessee, not legally, but in fact it did. All, almost uh, uh, upon uh, the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, the Union Army began to open uh, in enlistment offices for African American soldiers. This is a, uh, uh, let's see, make sure I've got the right one here. Uh, this is from Leslie's Illustrated newspaper, May 1864, showing African American volunteers boarding a train uh, to go to Murfreesboro. There were approximately 30,000 African Americans who served in the armed forces of the United States from Tennessee. Untold others uh, served as laborers, sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly in the Union Army. Fort Negley right over here was built in large part by Union labor. And my friend Bobby Lovett estimates that between 600 and 800 African Americans died in the effort to build Fort Negley. Uh, it's really hard to uh, get your arms around the importance of African Americans and their contribution, and Tennesseans. Uh, as soon as Union armies came anywhere near, uh, African Americans voted with their feet. And so the first, uh, the, the Union army didn't know what to do with them, and that was an issue they had to, to try to figure out how to handle. They first declared them contraband of war and set up contraband camps. And the first contraband camp was in uh, November 1862. But eventually there were 17 contraband camps throughout Tennessee harboring thousands of African Americans who had fled to freedom. This is, this is a jewel in the collection here. This is uh, Adam and Hannah Watkins. He is a former slave born in 1843. She was born in 1845. Uh, he was from Clarksville. He enlisted in the Union Army as under the name of Robert Barker. In, on 7 December 1863, he was a member of Company C, the 16th United States Colored Troops. They fought here in the Battle of Nashville. Uh, he and Hannah ended up having nine children. Interestingly, the first child was born in 1858, before the Civil War. The, the second oldest child is born in 1862. He, he, he escaped from slavery, joined the Union Army, as you know, in December 1863. After the war, they moved to Illinois. Uh, he died uh, sh shortly after the turn of the century, and she applied for a Union pension in 1905. We not only have this wonderful tin type, but we also have uh, accompanying documentation and papers from the family. This Harper's Weekly shows uh, Ambrose Burnside entering Knoxville in October 1863. East Tennessee is finally liberated. Once that happens, then enlistment activities really begin, uh, certainly in East Tennessee. Uh, you'll notice here, October 1863, uh, Knoxville, uh, they're already setting up recruitment stations throughout East Tennessee. Uh, there were at least, I've already mentioned, 30,000 African Americans who served in the Union Army. There were 20, 25,000 other Tennesseans who served in the Union Army. There are many, many other stories we could tell here. Uh, this is David Farragut from, from outside of Knoxville. Went off in the Navy, served in the Navy during the War of 1812. Uh, of course, stays with the Union. 
and becomes the first man to rise to the rank of Admiral in the United States Navy. Uh, the hero of the Battle of Mobile Bay, ironically, facing the most powerful ironclad of the war, the Confederate ship Tennessee at the Battle of Mobile Bay. This is Horace Maynard, who was originally from the North. He was a professor of mathematics at what is now the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, an outspoken unionist, uh, traveled with Andrew Johnson on the lecture circuit in the spring of 1861, uh, uh, trying to keep Tennessee in the union. Became, uh, had two, one son went to Annapolis at the end of the war, another son, another son, son was in the Union Army. Alvin Gillum from Jackson County, uh, a, a strong Unionist. Here you see him as a Brigadier General in the Army, and he was also, ironically, instrumental in hunting down uh, his troops, uh, John Hunt Morgan in Greenville. All the Unionists were not East Tennesseans. This is a very interesting banner. Grand Army of the Republic, West Tennessee, Carroll County, Huntington, Tennessee. Uh, Isaac Hawkins Post. Well, who was Isaac Hawkins? He had moved to Car uh, Carroll County in 1828 where he practiced law. He'd served in the Mexican War. He was a delegate to the Peace Conference in 1861, a desperate attempt to try to keep the Union together. But when secession happened, he recruited the 7th Tennessee Cavalry West Tennessee Union men, uh, and he served as their lieutenant colonel. He was captured in 1864. The Confederates particularly hated these Tennesseans who served in the Union Army. They considered them traitors. There was a lot of bad blood, and that bad blood went on after the war was over. Uh, after the war, Isaac Hawkins served in the United States House of Representatives. You find this throughout West Tennessee. If you go to Henderson County today, you can reliably expect Henderson County is going to vote Republican because they were pro-Union uh, when the war broke out and they remain Rock River Republicans ever since. So here's the state capitol photograph taken by George Barnard in 1864. You can see the fortifications there when it was known as Fort Johnson, when Andrew Johnson was military governor. Uh, uh, miraculously, it survived. And I'll show you our final image here, which is grave of New York, uh, uh, the cemetery of New York troops in Knoxville. Uh, the legacy of the Civil War was long lasting. Uh, we know the politics of the Civil War. Certainly, I remember as, as somebody from Upper East Tennessee. Uh, 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 I mean, everybody up that part of the state was a Republican. It was, you were Republicans in great degree as a legacy of the Civil War. Um, civil rights, the struggle that has endured for 100, 150 years later, um, as, and, and still grappling with what it meant to be a unionist, what the union represented, what the United States represents. But uh, thank you. I'll be glad to hopefully answer any questions you might have. Anything else? Well, thank you very much.